This is Glen Coe, a glen of exquisite beauty and yet a valley of endless tears. In its beauty there's a dark bloodstain that will never be wiped clean. A massacre of unwitting hosts, a murder under trust. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you the story. If you're watching this, then I'm guessing that you've heard at least something of the Glencoe Massacre. Campbells murdering McDonald's after enjoying their hospitality. In the Highlands, but surely anywhere, a deadly sin. In one of the local inns to this day, there's a sign saying no hawkers and no Campbells. Now, I think that's largely for effect. But a transatlantic cousin of Scots descent told me that at their Highland gatherings, they refused to talk to adherents of Clan Campbell. In fact, that 300-year-old atrocity is so abhorrent, so unforgivable, that to this day, they won't even eat Campbell's soup. Is that really the way to think about it? In the first two weeks of February 1692, a group of soldiers under Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon had been billeted here with the McDonald's of Glen Coe. When the troops arrived, McDonald's were suspicious. But Campbell presented papers requiring quarters to be given in lieu of taxes. And since Alistair McKeon, the chief of the Glencoe McDonald's, had signed a submission to King William's authority only a month before, he could hardly refuse. The culture of Highland hospitality would have made refusal difficult anyway. Soldiers and their clansmen hosts shared buildings like this reconstruction at the National Trust for Scotland's Visitor Centre in Glencoe. And as the days passed, they lived, hunted, ate, drank, gambled and exchanged stories and songs. Barriers slowly came down. Then on the 12th of February 1692, orders came down. Ultimately, those orders had come from London. The McDonald's of Glencoe were to be wiped out entirely, slaughtered like the animals that they were. In truth, the orders came earlier than this, but they'd passed through a lot of hands to get there. And before he passed them on, Colonel John Hall, governor of the garrison at Fort William, questioned the orders. Alistair McKeon had come to the fort to sign his submission to King William before the deadline date of the 31st of December. Hall had reluctantly told him that he had to head through howling Hogmanay snow to sign in the Campbell town of Inverary. Bad weather, detention by government troops and a sheriff who was on holiday then vacillated as to what to do meant that the signature wasn't actually taken until the 6th of January. A month later, some larger clans still haven't signed and Colonel Hill has given both verbal and signed indemnities and assurances of protection to McKeon and some of the MacDonald clansmen. Why carry out an inhuman act of terrorism against them? In truth, he knew. To instill terror in those other clans was exactly the purpose. The MacDonalds of Glengarry had castle walls to overcome. Much easier here. But what was Hill to do? An elderly gentleman with two spinster daughters and still waiting for money that the government owed him. He was in no position to resign. Plus, the authorities suspected over long that Hill had treated these Highlanders with too much humanity. So they placed under him the ruthless, ambitious Deputy Governor, James Hamilton, with whom they could deal directly. Under him, they sent Major Robert Duncanson, leading half of the Regiment of Argyles. They could be relied on. Eventually, Hill passed the orders on to Hamilton. He'd positioned troops at Inverlochy, whilst Major Duncanson had his at Balhoolish. Each of these forces would cut off one end of the glen and set Captain Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon to do his work inside. As dusk fell, Hamilton forwarded order to Duncanson. Fall on the McDonald's at 7am. I'll take my troops over the pass and down the aptly named Devil Staircase to close the glen from Rannoch. Duncanson forwarded the orders with a message to Campbell of Glen Lyon. Only now 
did Glenn Lyon find out why he'd been sent? He was to fall on the McDonald's, not at 7am, but 5 the next morning. Duncanson wanted to get there when it was all over. If you were Alistair McKeon of the Glencoe McDonald's, you would be in your bed at 5am, woken by a servant that tells you that the soldiers that you'd hosted these last two weeks were at the door. They'd received their orders. Assuming that their orders were to move off elsewhere, you tell the servant to organise some whisky so that they can take some hospitality before they go. It's as you're pulling on your trousers that you look up to see That was the start of the slaughter. Up and down the glen, there are little townships, clusters of houses like these ruins at Achtreichten. One such township was in Vriggen, where Campbell of Glen Lyon's company and one of his men later reported, I saw eight persons killed and several houses burned, and women flying to the hills to save their lives. MacDonald of Inveriggen and his eight men of his household were carried beyond the door, still bound hand and foot. They were thrown upon the dunghill, and there Glen Lyon shot in Vriggen. One by one, the others were also killed. A slow, methodical slaughter with musket and bayonet. A soldier who rifled through Inveriggen's coat brought his captain a paper that he'd found, and Glen Lyon called for a torch so that it might be read. It was a letter from Colonel John Hill giving the Macdonald protection and assuring him that he and his family, his land and his stock were free from molestation. Now Glen Lyon stood between his soldiers and the final victim and he said, Hold! As the soldiers stared, Captain Thomas Drummond arrived and demanded of the waiting soldiers, Why is he still alive? What of our orders? Kill him! When no one moved, Drummond raised his pistol and shot the young man through the head. A young boy ran out of the darkness and as he clawed at Glen Lyon's legs, crying that he would go anywhere with a Campbell if his life was just spared, Glen Lyon could say nothing and the boy was shot in Captain Drummond's order. As Captain of Grenadiers, Drummond's orders were followed. It just sounds better if it was a Campbell. What they don't say is that the troops weren't all Campbells. Privates in the muster rolls included Campbell, McCallum, McDermott, McKissick, McKellar, McIver, McGewer and McNichol. Lowland NCOs had been brought in from their regular army to stiffen up the raw Argyll conscripts. Men like John Kilpatrick, Walter Purdy, John Lindsay, Robert Barber, John Lundy, Walter Bruss and Robert Jackson. And of course, Major Duncanson, who led them, was from Stirlingshire. That's a lot of folk to ignore at your clan gathering. Neither were the clansmen of Glencoe all Macdonalds. I met up with archaeologist Derek Alexander at the remains of one of the massacre sites, the township of Achtreichten. It was the work of Derek and his team that had given us the information for building this turf house. And as we chatted, we discussed how the townships in this glen would have contained Rankins, McCalls, McPhails and Hendersons that we're going to come back to. But a clash of clans between Campbells and McDonalds is so much simpler. More Hollywood. Of course, there would have been McDonalds in these houses who'd carried out raids in Campbell lands. And there would have been Campbells amongst the troops who still bore a grudge. But the Campbells themselves stole from neighbours. Here, they were just useful tools of state. Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon wasn't chosen to captain the murder squad by accident. Notorious as a drinker, gambler and debtor, he'd had to sell his own lands to the Duke of Athol to cover debts. He'd been taken under wardship of Campbell of Bredalbin and Argyll to stop him racking up more debt. His lack of reliability is probably why he was never informed of the plan until the night before the morning's massacre. His indebtedness was why there were orders that he couldn't afford to ignore. And just in case, when his instructions came, they included the words, 
See that this be put in execution without feud or favour, else you may be expected to be dealt with as one not true to the king. This massacre was ordered by the king. This massacre happened because these clansmen had been slow to submit to that king. In 1688, William of Orange had landed in the south of England and he'd taken over from James VII and II. They called it the Glorious Revolution because there was no bloodshed in England. There followed 60 years of blood and conflict in Scotland and the bloodshed in Ireland has barely stopped to this day. It's a dilemma, isn't it? What do you do when a new king overthrows the old one to whom you've pledged allegiance? What do you do when a new crime family takes over the protection of your streets? What do you do when a corporate takeover restructures your department or rationalises your job? What do you do when your new boss tells you that your next job is to murder men, women and children in cold blood? If you sound an oath to the king, and Article 16 says that refusing an order can result in death, Article 9 says that giving advice or intelligence to the enemy means death, Article 19 says that to commit murder or willful killing is death. Now your orders are to go out and murder those children. What do you do? I said we'd come back to the Hendersons. This is a Henderson stone. The story goes that the night before the massacre there was a game of shinty going on. One of the Argyll soldiers was dealing with the very dilemma that I've presented to you. What does he do? And it's said that having drawn the attention of a local with a fixed look, he talked to the stone, saying, Great stone of the glen, great is your right to be here. But if you knew what will happen this night, you would be up and away. Did these things happen? Did something like it happen? We know that two officers who came over the hills with Deputy Governor Hamilton broke their swords rather than follow orders. Other soldiers looked the other way as people fled to safety. There's some indication that some of the Campbell Highlander privates were far more disgusted by the task than some of the lowland sergeants that had a hatred of all gales. John Dalrymple, 1st Earl of Stair and the Secretary of the King, was the lowlander who ordered and expressed glee at the prospect of this slaughter. But he was 500 miles away in Kensington when it happened and King William slept soundly in his bed. Maybe this massacre wasn't so much hatred of your neighbour as contempt from a distance. Was it really about Campbell's and McDonald's? I'm not suggesting for a moment that there was no clan loyalty or enmity when it came to these clans, but in drawing rooms far from this glen, people in power used loyalty and enmity for their own ends, McDonald's and Campbell's a sacrificial lamb and a scapegoat before the altar of power. Glencoe was about who would submit to power and who would look the other way. In France, James had cared little for those who so preciously protected their oath to him. In Britain, King William ordered a massacre. The Earl of Stair delighted in it. Colonel Hill despaired of it. Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton welcomed the opportunity for advancement. Campbell of Glenlyon was ambivalent. Many scribbling solicitors were just doing their jobs. And the soldiers whose job it was had many different names and made different choices on that night. There's no shortage of guilt to go round, but judgment doesn't rest with a clan or a name but the moral choice is made by many individuals in a long, linked chain. The biggest question of Glencoe is, what would I have done? What would you have done? There's another video about the Jacobit years coming up on screen now. In the meantime, Hamian Dawkins can be a lama alive. Cheery and drastic.